Hello! Today we're going to talk about magnetic flux and Faraday's law. We have two goals. This should be a relatively short session, by the way. So we'll uh, define magnetic flux and then we'll introduce Faraday's law of electromagnetic induction. And it's a very important uh, rule, very important law of physics. And it turns out to be the basis of most electricity generation. So anything we use a turbine which would be a wind power system, uh, hydroelectric generation, power generation, anything that burns fossil fuels, oil-fired power plants, coal-fired power plants, nuclear power plants, in fact, and natural gas power plants all use Faraday's law to generate electricity. Okay, so let's just start with flux. So out on the street, you hear flux used in various ways. And I looked up flux in dictionary.com, and it gave 10 different definitions. And I haven't repeated all of them, but I'll, I'll go through some of them. So you can use flux as a noun. And it means flow or flowing. It means continuous change, for instance. His political views are in a state of flux. So that means he's changing his political views. Uh, there's a couple of physics definitions. The rate of flow of fluid, particles, or energy. And the second one, a quantity expressing the strength of a field of force in a given area. There's some chemistry or metallurgy definitions. They gave three, in fact, but I will repeat one here. A substance used to remove oxides from and prevent further oxidation of fused metal, as in soldering or hot dip coating. You can use flux as a verb, meaning to melt. You can also use it uh, meaning to flow. Okay, so there's several definitions. It's not the whole set of definitions from dictionary.com, but it's several. Okay, so flux has a lot of different meanings. So how are we going to use it? Well, we're going to take this particular meaning here, okay, this second physics definition, and I'm going to redefine it as basically this is how I think about flux. Is a measure of the number of field lines that pass through an area. And in particular, we're talking about magnetic flux. So we're going to talk about magnetic flux as a measure of the number of magnetic field lines passing through an area. And we crazy physicists do, uh, well, crazy things all the time, but here's another crazy thing we do. We give area a vector. So if you take a piece of paper and put it down on your desk, so the paper is horizontal, well, the magnitude of the area vector is just the traditional area length times width. But then we assign a direction to that area vector, which is perpendicular to the plane of the piece of paper. So if your piece of paper is horizontal, then your area vector is vertical, either up or down. Okay, so then we define magnetic flux. Here's our symbol for flux, the Greek letter capital Phi. And we often put a little b down below to represent uh, magnetic flux as opposed to, say, electric flux. Magnetic flux is B, the strength of the magnetic field, times A, the magnitude of the area vector, times cos theta, and theta is the angle between the magnetic field and the area vector. Our unit for magnetic flux is the Weber. That's named after a, uh, an American physicist, if I remember correctly. And Weber is uh, field units, magnetic field units, times area units, that's tesla meter squared. So we'll often talk in class about um, fluxes in units of tesla meter squared, but the Weber is equivalent to that. Okay, so let's go through this in pictures a little bit. Okay, so there's our definition of magnetic flux again, B A cosine theta. And basically the more field lines pass through an area, the larger the flux. So let's look at the two pictures at the top left. So Picture A, in each case, is kind of a perspective view on what's going on. So we have uh, an area. It could be a piece of paper. It could be a wire loop. But it looks like it has a rectangular shape here. And it's got some arrows going through it. And those arrows represent magnetic field lines. And in this is the case where we get all sorts of flux. Okay. And if you look at the B diagram, well, that's kind of looking at the loop or the page, whatever it is along the direction of the magnetic field lines. 
So you've got little X's in that B picture. That represents the field lines going directly away from you as you look along the field lines. So you've clearly, clearly got lots of flux in this case because there's plenty of magnetic field lines passing through this loop. Okay. Now, the magnetic field is to the left in the A picture, and the area vector would be perpendicular to the plane of the loop. So in the perspective view, A picture, the uh, area vector would either be to the left or to the right. So your angle in that case would either be 0 degrees or 180 degrees between the field and the area vector. And cosine of uh, 0 gets you 1, cosine of 180 gets you negative 1. So the flux has maximum amplitude here. Okay, let's go to the pictures at the top right. Now we've got the same area, the same field, but we've rotated the loop, so we've changed theta. Okay, so the area vector there is either going up or down the screen where the magnetic field vectors point to the left. Then you get a 90 degree angle between your area vector and the field. So in that case, you get cosine of 90, and cosine of 90 is 0. And so you get no flux, and that's totally consistent with the fact that none of the field lines are going through that loop. Okay. And then the bottom pair of pictures represents kind of an intermediate case. And if you look at the B picture down at the bottom, it looks like we've got half the number of field lines going through as we had in the B picture at the top left. And so our cos theta must be a half, which means that our angle is 60 degrees. So our angle must be around 60 degrees to give us half the field lines here passing through that we started with. Okay, another way to think about it is say, um, say you made up a poster for some kind of poster presentation. And you're carrying it from your office to wherever the poster presentation is. But it's raining out. Okay. So if you hold your poster horizontal, tons of raindrops are going to hit your poster and probably ruin it. If you rotate your poster, so your poster itself is kind of vertical, the area vector would be horizontal in that case, then hardly any of the raindrops hit it. In fact, maybe none of them if there's no wind. And so you get no flux there. So it's kind of like that. So how many raindrops are going to hit your poster? You can vary that depending on the angle which you hold that poster. Okay, so then why do we care about flux? Well, we care about flux because it's very important for electricity generation. So that brings us to what's called Faraday's Law. One of the most practical um, examples from physics that we can come up with that applies to everyday life. Okay, so this is all about generating a voltage, generating electricity. So you take a coil, it's got n turns. So that means you get n circles of wire making up your coil. And the voltage induced is given by the rate of change, the time rate of change, of the magnetic flux in the coil. Okay, so expressing that as an equation, we've got our little squiggly E, Greek letter epsilon, uh, representing the induced EMF, the induced voltage. We've got a minus sign on the right-hand side. There's a whole, law, a whole other law that goes with that minus sign, which we will talk about next time. And minus n times delta flux over delta t, the time rate of change of flux. And it's not any old flux, it's magnetic flux to be specific. And again, it's hard to underestimate how important this is in terms of practical applications. Okay, So maybe you're looking at this movie on a laptop that's plugged into the wall. Maybe you're using a light that's uh, plugged into the wall. Just about all the electricity that comes out of the wall socket is generated using Faraday's law, exploring Faraday's law. The only thing I can think of that doesn't use it is a, uh, a solar photo photovoltaic system. So you get some solar panels that directly take uh, light energy and convert it to electrical energy. But just about every other form of electricity generation uses what's called a turbine, usually a steam turbine, and to produce that steam you're either burning something or you're taking energy from uh, stored in potential energy, gravitational potential energy of water behind a dam in, electric, in, a, in a hydroelectric facility, or you're extracting energy from the wind to turn a wind turbine, 
and you're moving a magnet near a coil or vice versa, you're generating electricity like this. Okay, so once again, we call this voltage that's produced by a change in magnetic flux an induced EMF. And why do we call it an EMF? Because, well, we've used EMF before to represent kind of the terminal voltage on a battery. And that's because this acts exactly like a battery does. Okay, so you can actually produce a current in a coiler loop without a battery simply by changing the magnetic flux through that coiler loop. If you got a complete circuit, you will have a current. You always have a voltage. If you have a complete current as circuit, you will have a current. Okay, so this is our final screen today. So once again, there's Faraday's law, and let's just write it out a second time. But instead of just putting phi, the Greek letter phi for flux, we'll put in what phi is made up of these three things: B, A, cosine theta. Okay, so if you could change any one of those things, B, A, or theta, with respect to time, you get a voltage. So this tells us really there are three main ways to generate a voltage using a magnetic field. You just change one of those three factors. For instance, change B, change the magnetic field. How do you do this? Well, let's say you have a loop of wire or a coil of wire, and you have a magnet. You just move the magnet around near the, near the loop or coil. That'll change B. That'll give you a voltage you can change the area, maybe. Okay, so maybe you have a flexible enough loop that you can squeeze it to change its shape, and thereby changing the area. And you can also change theta. That means changing the orientation of the loop with respect to the field. Okay, and an easy way to do that is to spin the loop. And in fact, this is generally how most electricity generating turbines work. They usually have a fixed field, a fixed area loop, and then they will either spin the loop in the field and generate a electricity that way, or sometimes they will have a fixed loop and they will take these permanent magnets and they will spin them around the loop and they will steadily change the magnetic field. And uh, that's how almost all electricity is generated that comes out of the wall socket, as we talked about before. So unbelievably important. Okay, so that is all for today.